We can start. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. This is Dina's of Working Group. We have two hours uh, this session. Uh, I'm Benno. Tim is sitting over there. Suzanne is over here. Um, scribe is who's the scribe actually? Uh, Java Scribe is um, Dan York and. Brian Haberman will be helping him out because I don't okay. think Dan can be here for the whole meeting. And our minute taker is Paul uh, Hoffman. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thanks, all. Okay. Welcome, Lehman. Ah, oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the note well. Take notice of this. Note well is also applies to this working group, of course. Uh, blue sheets, please fill them in. We have a full room. We want to have a large room and uh, for the next time also to accommodate everyone. Thank you. Uh, agenda, we have a full agenda. So please bear with me if we are a little bit strict on time management, depending on the discussion, of course. Um, we have some current working group business, the A name. Uh, we have something like the chair's introduction. We will give a brief context about A name and a new uh, draft uh, by Eric Negan. I, sorry, I've mispronounced your name. Um, about uh, HTTPS SVC. We will give a little bit of context how they overlap, but also differ. Uh, new working business, it's not all new, but it's not, it's not a DNS up working business yet, is uh, work on the RDD, RDBD by Stephen and maybe Karsten. Okay, some uh, will give a presentation. Uh, new work by Paul, Mora, uh, Giovanni will give an update. Etc. If time permits, uh, what um, Kuczynski, <laughs> very good, will give a presentation on Dina's covered. Good. Um, let's get started. So we want to start with the A name discussion here. Um, a name has seen a number of iterations. Um, after Tony did some uh, redrafting of the document, it simplified the A name draft and it made the distinction between the authoritative part and the recursive part. So much of the complexity are in the recursive part and the more simple use cases are in the authoritative part. Uh, A name, at least it started out to solve a problem like an uh, alias or a C name in the Apex, um, but it also has other, other solutions. So it's a solution, a sponsor solution space. With the recent HTTPS SVC proposal, it addresses partly the same problem, provisioning web services or names for web services on different, maybe multiple CDNs. So that seems to be an overlap. So uh, the chairs still believe they address different problem spaces with an overlap, but are still both worthwhile to explore. So let's keep that in mind when we discuss the different uh, drafts. Um, more specifically, A name, and um, if you have more interest in that use case, uh, A name is very interesting if you talk about APIs. So if you go for fertilization, you have all kinds of services on different places that move around. You want to, so it's not specific. It has it started. A name work started out for the web services and the CDNs and provisioning. But it has a larger solution space, also for APIs, and not necessarily web services, web browsers. Um, Tim, should I mention something else on this topic to give some context? 
So, so for the A name, keep in mind there's the, the authoritative part, complex, uh, less complex, and the recursive part. For HTTPS, it's straightforward, quote unquote, solution, but it probably needs some additional processing for the records. But we expect, I'm not a web uh, browser developer, this additional processing is probably done by the web browsers anyway. Or might be, end up somewhere extra work in Libc, I don't know. But that's also something to discuss during the draft. I think I give sufficient context on uh, both the draft. Uh, we reserved quite some time, 20 plus 20 minutes, so it's about 40-ish minutes, including discussions, of course. Um, I think we go to the remote presentation uh, by Matthijs. Evan will be in the room, is in the room, and is, will act as a backup for discussions and explanations. I don't think it's necessary, but okay, thank you. Sorry, I can't switch this up now. Hello. Hello, Matthijs. Ah, you okay. can hear me. Hello, Matthijs. Uh, yeah, we do hear you. I do see you. And I think, yeah, on the large screen, you're also visible. Please. Um, I'm... I will go to the slides, sorry. Yeah, thanks. I think that's my task. <laughs> this one, yeah. Oh, yes. You see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please go ahead and say next. Next slide. So Benno already mentioned a little bit on the motivation. Um, so this slide should be uh, a little bit of repetition. This is uh, the motivation we started out. We want to do the CNAME at the apex. Uh, obviously, it's work for the CDNs, but it's not the only use case, although admittedly, it's probably the largest use case. Um, DNS providers with CDN customers now have their own proprietary solutions, and so it's hard for them to to switch providers or support multiple model. Next slide. A little bit of history. Um, basically, forget everything before the Dasho two version. Uh, that version, I think, is a the fundamental basis of a name, everything before had some issues. It required to resolve a spot, which made it hard to deploy. Uh, it had issues with zone transfers. And so the rewrite actually makes it much simpler uh, in the sense that it makes a name processing optional in every place, but possible in any place. Uh, what that means is that an authoritative can do the a name processing uh, but then the resolver can also do the A-name processing, and that might be redundant if both do them, but it still works. Um, from there, I sort of took the editing uh, obligations on me, and I made it first an editorial uh, version, which is a Dash 3, and then uh, a one that resolves some issues that were still existing in the Dash 2 version. Next slide. Yeah. So the Dash 2 version, for those who haven't been following the A-Name work, is a much cleaner version. Uh, it makes the resolver support optional uh, and even the target lookup optional. Um, that means that if nobody's doing A-Name, it's not so useful. It would be similar to just publishing address records in the zone. But uh, the expectation is that the DNS provider will implement the target lookup at uh, the authorities. Uh, as their uh, alternative to the proprietary solutions. Um, there's no longer an exception for zone transfers. There's lots of flexibility to that, to your use case. Um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. So the Dash 3 is uh, mostly style structure, uh, some moving text from, from the main body to the appendix because it's more a background information. Um, 
And I want to do this version before going into the issues to, to make a clear cut. So that explains why we have a dashboard tree. Uh, next slide. Dashboard 4 deals with a lot of uh, uh, issues that were uh, mentioned on the list, put into the GitHub, and then, and then resolved. Uh, these three, I think, are the main ones. Uh, the first one is A-name precedence. So it was a discussion whether the addresses that are next to the A-name, whether they should override the A-name or could be used as a default when the lookup fails, for example. Uh, we resolved it to being as a default. Uh, that means in the Dashu 2 version, that was already the case. So little text changes uh, were needed for the Dashu 4. The second one is the TTL considerations. Uh, when doing a target lookup, uh, now when you have resolved the target and you're going to replace the sibling address records, uh, the TTL will be the minimum of all the encountered TTLs. So if you're uh, doing a lookup in your C name or your A name, you will minimize the TTL uh, and then eventually will the target and so you're going to replace the sibling address and the TTL will be the lowest you encounter. This is because when you're doing this at the authoritative, you're actually uh, playing as a resolver and so you can do some caching, but then you have a cache at your authoritative and then the client will ask for records and they will cache it there themselves as well. So there's some TTL stretching here and, and taking the minimum TTL will uh, mitigate against this a little bit. We also put some text in there for those stretching considerations, uh, explain what exactly happened. And the third point is uh, whether the uh, sibling Edwix records should be in the additional section now, let me rephrase again, whether when you do a, a, a address query, so Q type is A or quad A, uh, whether the A name should be in the answer section or in the additional section. Uh, a name is part of the answer, so it makes sense to put them in the A name section, but Tony pointed out that with D name, this caused a lot of issues. Um, and still, uh, on the DNS up list, it looked like there was a slight uh, consensus, slightly leaning towards putting the AM in the answer section. So the Dash 4 has a uh, specification around that and puts AM in, in the answer section. Um, next slide. This is a list of all the issues we resolved on the GitHub. Um, so you can see there's a lot of work being done. Next slide. There are some open issues. One of them is the loop detection issue. And the loop detection issue is the uh, point where you're doing a query, an address query, uh, and you're following the target. Uh, so an address query, which has an A name on that same name, uh, may trigger an additional query to look up that target that can hit another server that has an A name and that will point back to eventually the, the same server creating a loop. And it's very hard to detect that loop. Uh, Jan posted this to the list with some uh, options to resolve it. Uh, one option is to put the logic that a Q type A name means that the affordative server should not or must not chase the targets. So that actually avoids uh, or allows for a target lookup uh, without have to worry about a, a loop. And the other one is having an EDNS option. And that says, don't chase targets. I know a name myself. Um, my Personal uh, um, consideration with the last one is that eventually we'll hope that the browsers will query for a name or or similar record, and how will they uh, signal that support? 
And also in the current version of the uh, draft, we say before Div can do uh, anion processing, Resolver can do anion processing. Uh, so if a Resolver signals support for anion, an authoritative uh, could still chase targets because it wants to give the most optimized response. Um, so that's one issue. Next slide. Another open issue is what to do if you're doing anion processing and the target lookup fails. Um, so basically how to treat an error response. My feeling is that, that you could uh, use the uh, currently known sibling adder circuits as the best effort. Or another option is to return surfail because on your lookup something unexpected habit. So would you give back a, a slightly less optimized response or would you prefer to signal that uh, that, that lookup fails? Um, next slide. So there's actually a couple of more uh, issues. There's no slide for that, but uh, better provided a, a review. Uh, on aiming, which has some slight, uh, some small issues uh, that I think also need to be covered. Uh, together with that, I think we should uh, cover those issues, uh, hopefully shortly after this um, meeting. Uh, my plan is to publish a Dash 5 and hopefully that will be a version that can go to working group last call. And I think that's it. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Any comments from the room? Questions, remarks? Uh, ben Schwartz, Google. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors on the draft that will be presented next, um, which, as Benno mentioned, uh, also bears on some of these issues. Uh, and so I don't want to give too much of a, a preview or uh, mix the topics, but I'll just say that I, um, I've i come to the conclusion that, that I think we do want both of these proposals, um, that, that I, I personally think that we should probably standardize both. But I do think that there's an opportunity to, um, to simplify a name by essentially taking some of the use cases that generate complexity and, and sort of pushing them over to the HTTPS service draft. And so for that reason, I'd like to see if we can uh, not go to last call until we've had a chance to absorb both of these options and, and see what the best way is to divide functionality between them. Yeah, thank you. Evan Hunt, ISC. Uh, I was the original a -Name draft author, and I wanted to um, make a similar but also kind of different point. Um, I also don't think we should go to last call uh, but it has always been my opinion from the beginning that the reason I was doing the A-Name draft was that I did not expect browser uptake of any other solution. Um, I'm getting the impression now that there is some momentum for browsers to take up HTTP SVC, and I believe that if they do so, I would personally recommend that we not proceed forward with A-Name uh, and suggest that we shelve it until such time as we have a, a really clear use case that justifies the weight on the camel. Um, that said, however, since I don't know yet whether the browsers are in fact going to pick up HTTP SVC, uh, I think we need to carry on as if they won't until we find out that they will. But I, I think that I think that working group last call might be premature at this point. Tim Wisinski, I know I made some comments, kind of cautious about it, H, um, HTTP SVC, but I've really come around on it. Um, I like a lot of the ideas, especially about putting you know stuff in there, but. I, I never saw a name as trying to solve the web problem. I've always saw it trying to solve the um, name at apex problem. And so, and I think part of my problem, this is why I didn't want to sit up there today, because um, I spend way more of my day now talking about containers and sidecars and service meshes and all these things. And I'm thinking about like, I see where a name, I get host by name, right? I remember mentioned that to Eric and I was like, how do we, you know, how, you know, and I, Eric's, you know, Eric had some great answers for that, right? But and I look at all these zones. So I'm an operator, right? And I, I work for a crazy company that does weird things. And so 
but I spent a lot of time looking at zone data. I see no zones anymore with A and quad A in them anymore. And they do crazy things where they're just service cuts. You know, they're just doing zone cuts all over the place and then doing, oh, we're going to do AWS security based on doing zone cuts. And then everybody's just doing alias records, you know, at various apex points and stuff like that. And nobody has an A or quad A anywhere. And it's just like, okay, this is a totally different reality than I think anybody's ever thought of, right? And so it's like, I think I'm in a weird world and I understand that, but I'm trying to figure, I think they both have value, like you say, and I'm, I'm but it's like, I think a name needs to be simpler. It's probably the best way to say, say it. And I can see a name being like your worst case performance thing for web stuff. And then, hey, that makes you want to like move to the HTTP service much faster kind of thing. So I, yeah, that's my opinion, but yeah. And thank you, Matthias, for all this work. And so I think it's really good. I think. We're, yeah, I think we need another, another rev on that if people want it. And I don't know if the working group wants to do one or two. So we'll leave it to the chairs. Uh, Ron Dixon, GoDaddy. Um, I, I agree with most of the previous folks that HTTP SVS definitely is, uh, SVC is, uh, is the way to go for the web use case. Um, I'm wondering for the API use cases whether it's feasible to go back to you to the the larger, more generic um, uh, SRV uh, if it's feasible at all. But it's something to to consider as well. Um, but definitely, uh, my my vote would be for putting a, putting a bit of a break on a name until we know about uh, the the other proposal. Okay, thank you. Petrus Pacek, CZ, I think. Uh, I think that the last call is, well, premature. Uh, the sections one, one to four are okay-ish and could solve the interoperability problem between cloud providers, and that's okay. But the processing on the resolver side, sections five and six, needs more work. So we either postpone the last call and refine resolver processing or split it to two drafts and, you know, do solve the interoperability for cloud providers and then go and look at the optimizations because the resolver processing is just optimization, not a requirement. Yeah, I think Serge will discuss both options with the authors. Yeah, thanks. Just, Thank you. just to clarify, I'm not suggesting to do the current version as a working group last call. Um, the issues that Petra mentioned on the list and the loop detection issue and the remaining issues need to be resolved first in a dash of five. Uh, <clears throat> hi, it's Tail. Um, Tim, you managed to confuse me a little. Uh, <laughs> you started off by saying you never saw a name as solving the web problem, but as just solving the C name at the apex problem, which I understand all those words, but to me, the compelling use case that C name at the apex was the problem for was the web, and I wasn't aware that there were other compelling use cases. And 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 records at the apex make a big difference there. So f for the remote participants, the okay. different use cases are service endpoints. Yeah. So um, then, uh, great that there's another use case. I'm down with that. But I think that um, it sh probably should be mentioned in the draft. You know what the, what these other use cases are. So. Sorry, sorry about that. Tomasinski again. Yeah. I, it's it's not even it's not even like the browser stuff. It's all the backend servers that talk to all the backend services that talk to all the various things that are basically and they're just setting up zones and they're sending something at the apex because it's like why not? I have an apex, right? Why do I need to actually add anything else to it? You know, it's like they're an engineer, they're working in some application space, and the world is kind of wonderful to them, right? And so, um, and. Wait, wait. So you're saying the world is kind of wonderful to engineers? I yes. Just want to <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, and so that is sort of a different use case than, you know, but if you're in this weird container world, which everybody is, seems to be running into at full speed, right? There's, they're just these elastic services, fancy cloud things that people get, and you never get an answer, you know, you never get an, an A record until the very end, basically, right? So takeaway is put that in the draft. Yeah. So. Eric Nigra and Akamai. And I think on some of those, um, that, that particular use case of, of cloud services, I think one thing that before jumping straight into A name as a solution there 
might be to step back and work with some of those folks to figure out what the requirements are. Because I think when you look at the requirements in that space, especially with things like service meshes and similar becoming more common, that oftentimes those things are wanting to go from a name to a to a more complicated set of stuff. Like they're looking to go to a IP port pair. So it may actually be that maybe even SRV or HTBF server, something else is actually more applicable yeah. than a, than a name to solve that problem. Okay. So concluding here. Uh, so I, I, it, uh, I can I comment yes. on that? Um, I I am not convinced yet that we should uh, put all the use cases in here. I feel like uh, people seeing a name and uh, thinking, "Hey, this might fit my use case." Uh, now, uh, additional requirements will come there. I think a name uh, initially uh, the motivation was to have something else than the propriety AES CNAMIC Apex solutions, and those those all are basically point to a different name at your apex. Uh, that is what a -name provides. Um, sure, if the working group now thinks we should come up with a solution that fits both CDN and the service endpoints and the apex, then then we then we should take, take a step back. But that was never the initial case of a -name. So putting all those many use cases in the draft, I'm not convinced that is a good idea. Uh, it, it's a lot of extra work that's just delaying uh, actual implementation of a name. Okay. Thank you. Um, to make some progress, well, I'm just proposing this without any consultation. Uh, maybe, so in August, uh, Tim always tells that all the Europeans are on holiday, so nothing happens. But maybe in September, uh, October ish, early October, we can plan a virtual meeting on this topic to get the use case or the, the, the overlap and the differences and more clear, straightened out, so we have something more, a next step for the next IDF meeting in Singapore. Okay, thank you. We will send some follow-up emails to the mailing list to coordinate this. Okay, thank you, Matthijs. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So, okay, thank you. Um, next, yeah, Eric. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, so here's the clicker. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I, I switched it off. <laughs> no degree of eating. Okay, that's better. No degree of eating the mic would have helped in that case. Um, so eight, I'm going to talk about HTTP SVC, which is a little bit of a mouthful. Um, the the goal here was looking at a bunch of these different use cases that were coming up um, in a number of working groups in TLS, DNS op, HTTPBIS, um, quick, and trying to see if there's a holistic solution for them. Because one of the problems we're running into is, is that we're running into this chicken and the egg of various things wanted to have a, um, some information in the DNS to use to prime before making a connection to, um, an HTTPS co connection. But there was a concern on the browser side on, um, this, like, oh, if we have to go do an extra DNS lookup for that particular use case, what is going to be the performance impact? What's going to be the impact on um, bad home um, bad home recursive resolvers that, that don't know about extra record types? Is um, And also, as you start accumulating these different record lookups, um, are you going to be in a situation before where, where it's not just one lookup you have to make, but it's 10 different lookups, and then you have correlation issues between them? So... Um, HTTPS SVC tries to look at some of these holistically. Um, the things which some of the use cases we've been trying to address have been the encrypted SNI keys um, discussion that's been going on in the TLS working group, um, in which we've had a number of design meetings around. There's the, the um, ability to, to negotiate a transport protocol, in particular for HTTP3, where with HTTP2, you can use ALPN to negotiate upwards, but with, um, with HTTP3, currently the only way to get to actually use quick is to first go through TCP via H2 or H1 and then get a header back that causes you to negotiate up. So there's an extra round trip there that having that information, having information in DNS could help skip. There is, um, a use case of 
indicating that, that an origin defaults to HTTPS. So for example, in the browser use case, if someone types a bare name like example.com into a web browser, does the web browser default in, um, to HTTP or HTTPS? Today it has to go to HTTP and securely and get a redirect back. And this provides an opportunity to, to have a, a much more safe and secure default as more things are becoming HTTPS by default. Um, and then the, a longstanding issue on the DNS op side is, is, hey, we created this SRV record. Why won't the browsers implement it? Um, and which led to a number of the ANAME discussions of, okay, we need to create ANAME because browsers won't implement, um, um, S haven't implemented S SRV and that chicken and egg there and being able to address that. But then also it's clear that with, we've been accumulating these use cases, there's probably going to be the nth plus one in a year or two or three from now. In fact, um, I've been kind of terrified at the number of people who have come, come up with other use cases, not all of which are applicable, um, in, um, since it's, um, since that or the first version of the draft was published. Um, so being, being able to be extensible without having to go and add new record types that browsers would have to look up. Um, so the goal here would be to have a single new brow, a, a single new record that browsers could resolve in parallel with the A and quad A lookups, um, that would be extensible enough that we could use for the next, solve kind of the, the current cases, but, um, but, um, but also be extensible enough to cover the next few. The, um, but also to do this in a way that's, that is, um, usable for operators, usable for site, um, site owners, and has some ability to do some of the kind of performant optimization so that it doesn't have a huge, lots of different RTTs in the case where it has been set up sanely. There's going to be obviously going to be some corner cases where things are going to have more performance overhead. But I think another goal here is to have something that's compelling enough to, con to finally convince clients and browsers that it's going to go implement it. And any one of these use cases, like SRV, may not have been enough to get browsers to implement it, but if we can solve a few of these together plus the next few um, and, and move to more secure defaults, that may be enough to, um, and has gotten some interest from browsers of this may actually be enough to start moving the needle and to do something here. So structure-wise, when looking at this record, um, there's a number of properties of this that end up being um, similar to the concept of SRV. And I think the idea here is that, that within a given, um, within a given resource record or RR, there's a number of these things you need to glue together and return back to clients as a, a single unit. And some of those may be references off to other things to go use. So in the SRV case, it was a, um, you had as the name something which was Basically, the name and the, uh, the the port in the, the scheme, and the the target of um or the, the data of the RR was a combination of things. It was that service dom it was a a domain name, it was a port, um, uh, um and uh, um priority information. Um, HTTPS SRV basically t starts off with that basic kind of um port and I and and host name that S SRV has, but then makes it extensible. So tied to those two and tied to that R, um, that RR, within that RR, you can start adding on additional information, such as, as the, what is the application protocol, such as H3 that supported, um, if there are any um, ESNI keys that are needed to negotiate and, and the handshake, what are those? And part of the reason why it's critical to have those kind of bound together at the RR is because like in the ESNI, um, discussions within the TLS working group, you may have these different different services being operated by different operators. You may have with transitions where where CNAME is, has switched from, or um, things are switching from one hosting provider to another, or you have operational upgrades, or you may have multi-CDN use cases, and you're trying to mix and match things like ESNI keys and which application protocol is supported with which actual um, services and ports to connect to doesn't work so well. Um, so there are two forms of the HTTPS SVC record. Um, one of the, um, if you look at the structure of the record, um, the, and the default in the kind of the, for the default HTTPS port and scheme, um, doesn't use any, um, label prefixes and that operationally makes a bunch of things easier. Um, but in the, the, in this alias form, the very first element is a, um, is a service record type zero. That means that it's alias form. There's a priority that, that isn't used in this record and this form, so it's zero. And then you have the service domain um, name. So in this, this form, it's purely an alias target. This is one which is 
handled by by clients. There's no special hand. Um, it's similar to SRV, where there's no special ha um, handling that's needed by authorities, no special handling needed in DNSSEC, no special handling needed in recursives. Um, and then there's the alternative service form, um, which is basically what you can think of as a SRV, an extensible SRV. So it starts off with um, the um, that service record type one saying that it's the alternative service form, followed by a priority, followed by the um, that um, that service domain name target, similar to S SRV, but then a bunch of extensible information. In this, we're proposing to use the things in the alt service format, which is a format that's defined in an RFC in the HTTP working group, um, and then at least one um, at least one browser supports, and is also part of how clients negotiate up to um, to quick in the in the HTTP three protocol. Um, and so in this case, it so in this case, the first one of these records would say say um, that you can either use quick to UDP um, over UDP to um, SV33. SVC3.example.net um, 8003 with this particular set of SNI keys, or you could do HTTP2 to, over TCP to a different SVC2 with a different port with these other um, ESNI keys. And I think one thing I'll um, highlight here is that, that while web browsers is a common use for HTTPS, HTTPS isn't just about web browsers. Like, as a, from a CDN perspective, we're actually seeing that a, a a huge fraction of traffic that we have is not for, is no longer just from browsers. It's also from API clients, um, thing, um, service to service calls, and a bunch of this information around kind of port associations and bindings and protocols are just as applicable to some of those um, in the cloud use cases as they are to the web browser use case. Um, on a how does this comp how do HTTPS service and a name compare to each other? I think. They're complementary. They solve different cases. There's not necessarily saying that one may need to replace the other. Um, I think there may be cases where if we look and say, say that we can have the two of these together and that they both fill things, that maybe we can reduce a bunch of complexity out of a name. It may be that looking at what is a coverage set of problem spaces we're trying to solve might be that there's a bunch of use cases out of a name that could just be pulled out and, and reduce the amount of camelage that's happening there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> the I think the big one of the big differences, and Ben helped um, clarify that clarify this in the, in the slides, was that that HTTPS SVC doesn't require any changes to DNS servers. It's basically something that's just a record type that has no special um, handling. Whereas a name, on the other hand, doesn't require any special changes to clients. The clients and with you have a name clients basically just magic all the existing clients magically work. With HTTPS SVC, all the existing name servers just magically work. Um, so that's probably the biggest distinction between those. And I think, but on the con side there, that means that HTTPS SVC is only respected by the compliant clients. So to add support into clients, it, which would um, Ideally, would be something that I'm expecting would happen at the client library perspective. And if we've been looking at the ecosystem of client libraries that are out there, there's a lot of cases on the HTTPS side where there's so much complexity involved in making an HTTPS connection already that a lot of operating that a lot of um, mature operating systems are starting to provide higher level abstractions. So applications aren't going and doing get host by name; they're going and provide calling some some OS or library API that is going and dealing with all the cert verification, um, DNS stuff, all that stuff for them. And this, so that's presumably where this would get shimmed in there. Um, a downside here is this is HTTPS specific, but again, HTTPS is not a, is not just about web browsers. And I think a consideration for this, if this is successful, might be that maybe there is a pattern here that some of the things we could learn by H, from HTTPS SVC might be applicable to other protocols and having a either more generic or other record type that kind of leverages off some of the things structure of this um, might make sense to, to have as more generic. And I think that may be also a question for the working group of how much makes sense to over genericize HTTPS SVC um, versus keep it focused on the HTTPS use case. Um, so next steps, we're gonna be talking about this also in the HTTPS HTTP um, BIS um, on Thursday. Um, 
initially had thought that was the best home for adoption. I think in talking with people here, I think there's a question on whether it makes sense to have whether to adopt this in DNS op or HTTP bis. I don't have a strong feeling either way. I think that's up to the working groups and the chairs on where they think would be the most constructive place and where there's the most interest in doing work on this. Um, and um, but I think no matter what, it's going to be critical to get to get input from both of those communities. And I think actually I've been very pleased on the amount of great feedback we've gotten from DNS so far, in particular, um, as we, um, the some of the stuff we had in the wire format didn't make sense, and we've cleared that up um, based. And I got some feedback from some browser implementations. In fact, there is a um, already a bind nine private type imp um, draft implementation that Mark Andrews did in the hackathon as presented yesterday. Um, someone did an implementation in Unbound. I was kind of surprised before I presented it that there are already two implementations. Um, but feedback, comments, suggestions are most welcome here. Thank you. Yeah, I think on the administrative issue, we had already actually, the, the chairs had already discussed this briefly, and I think what we're going to do is get together with the HTTPS uh, chairs, and we'll figure out where it belongs, but we're going to need review in both groups. Mm -hmm. Warren Kamari, um, would you mind going back to the thing where you had the alt service DNS, uh, HTTP one? Uh, yep. So a quick question, and sorry if you've already answered this, but it looks like there are a number of things that you can stick in, right? There's like H2, H3, MA persist, um, ES and IKEs. How big do these end up? Because I could see this getting really large, which is fun for DOS. I think that's the, that's definitely a concern and definitely, I think, I think that becomes a matter of how much gets shoved in here and we'll want to be, there'll want to be some guidance on what is appropriate to put in here and what's not appropriate to put in here. Like for example, one of the things that's been, been highlighted is that that not everything makes sense to, to especially if especially when um, DNS especially when DNS sec validation isn't being done by clients there's some things that you that might seem attractive to put in here but would have unfortunate security properties um, so I think a lot of the I think the things that you would want to put in here would need to have some constraints on and some consideration on what would make sense there um, there is already a um, the um, alt service already has a um, IANA registry for the alt service parameters, which is part of why we're using this to kind of leverage off of the, off of that. And this draft just adds proposes adding on the ES and I keys, but that could potentially be split off as a separate draft, and might make sense to do that. Um, and um, I think one question that's come up on the browser side that fits into that is to what degree would browsers do this over? Um, um, Do 53, Do 53, um, um, Dinos over 53 versus just doing this over Do, where some of the size issues become somewhat less, somewhat less of a problem. Hi, Oliver uh, Amazon Cloudflare. I like this a lot, um, and I think this is a much better and cleaner solutions than a name. But you have managed to walk into the biggest pitfall that DNS has ever had dealing with records. You have subtyping. And that has always bitten us back in the uh, foot and makes things very difficult. So I would propose that you get rid of this first numeric field in there and just have a case zero with an empty string. Just type two or type one as it is in there. That would be my suggestion. On this record, I'm not sure I follow. I'm not sure I fully follow, but I'm happy to kind of follow yeah, up. Basically, off. whenever you have uh, some interfaces that are provision, uh, provision interfaces, etc., they will write it based on the spec when it gets published. So when you do implement the next uh, asked form or service record type, it's not going to get supported ever by most of the provisioners because they are. Uh, it's a one-time only write process for them. Mm -hmm. We have this problem with DNS keys. We have this with uh, all kinds of other records. So just have one format and that is extendable in the string at the end mm -hmm. would be my suggestion. Uh, yeah, as for implementation, yeah, this is going to be easy to handle. But there is a question about the uh, SNI keys in the multi-cloud instance. G given a number of operators roll these keys over very rapidly, it's going to require online generation of these records. That'll be, and I think some of that may be interesting. That's probably a good discussion to have on the kind of the TLS side to see how that relates. Yeah, yeah. relates there. Okay. Okay. So we have sufficient time, but I want to close the line. Okay. Yeah.
Evan Hanto. Um, first of all, HTTPS SVC is way too much of a mouthful. I'm going to call it hat tip service from now on. I invite <laughs> you all to join me. Um, you mentioned implementation status on the DNS side. Do you have any information about implementation status on the browser side? Um, not any, yet. Any movement at all yet? Okay. I, I mention it because changes in implementation status on the browser side will inform the decisions that we make with respect to whether a name is worthwhile, I think. And I'd like to figure out how we can find out what, what, the, uh, what the early indicators will be if this is, uh, if this is actually getting uptake. Um, the other question I wanted to ask, um, Oliver already mentioned uh, subtyping, and I don't fear subtyping uh, as much. Have you, did you give any thought to um, genericizing this so that it wouldn't be specific to HTTPS and that uh, maybe an additional subtype field that would indicate that if this is for a, a different but similar use case that's not HTTPS? I, it's worth considering. I think my big worry about that would be that the RR set gets really big. Is that if you start, if you basically start putting all the potential services, if you basically put the like HTTPS as a key in there, and you don't do this as a, and you don't do a prefix label, then your RR set has to contain all the different possible services that you might support. Um, it's maybe I think it's worth maybe worth considering, um, or maybe worth having genericizing and like there's a bunch of different things I've thought about on the genericizing front. In fact, I, a few years back, I had a more generic draft that was very, very similar to this. Um, um, but, um, but I, and I think the what's so the one option might be to to have the format be generic, but then to ha but then for at least for a few of the most common RR types, or for a few, few of the most common application types, would just be to use a different RR type for um, for each of those. To, but still bounding that fairly small. Okay, thanks. Sorry, uh, I did close the, the mic line. So last question. Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo Colidi, I, I, th I also find sort of the, I see HTTPS service SVC, and I just keep hearing the word browser, 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 browser. Uh, why? Um, there are lots of applications that aren't browser. I mean, you, you, you yourself mentioned API endpoints and container, container communication. Uh, I, I would like to echo the call to sort of, can we, can we at least like try to design this to be generic and not like, because I, if, if we just keep using the word browser, we're going to end up doing some engineering that only actually really works for browsers. Mm -hmm. So if you have something like a split, like DNS was over with, uh, and application model, like, you know, most of Android is like that. You've got a DNS resolver and you've got a bunch of apps. You've got WhatsApp and this and that. And you could, you could say that WhatsApp's a browser because it just uses HTTPS. But I think we might, you know, it, it huh? TLS. TLS, server, yeah, TLS server seems like a good idea because it, it is, a lot of this is in fact TLS. But, um, you know, SMTP also uses TLS. It would be really good if we didn't box ourselves in. And I think also that would actually argue for not doing this, maybe in HTTP bis. So in the HTTP working group, but actually trying to do this maybe even here, you know? So, mm -hmm. well, actually, this group can't do protocols, or can it? I don't know. But it can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th then, then I think, you know, it would sort of, I think it would, I think it would help a lot if we, if we looked at, because I, I, I see maybe, you know, maybe this can become what SRV never could, right? So, and I think for size, you're concerned with size, but like I think in practice, we're actually going to end up doing this over TCP and encrypted transport anyway, because you probably don't want that stuff in the clear where anyone can mess with, oh, yeah, like I'm actually going to move this to a different port, right? Because like, oh, here, here's your new SNI keys because I'm in the middle and I happen to be your resolver. You don't want that anyway. So I think the, the sort of size constraints are really not, you know, material anymore. But that, that's just my personal opinion. So, either discussion on the microphone or. <laughs> All right, Stephen Farrell. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with the comment I will for me that people are rolling ESNI keys every hour at the minute. Now, there's only one real deployment, but nonetheless. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess my take is if browsers implement this, then I like it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, it's not clear to me, I mean, there's an ESNI or our type in the ESNI spec. Is your intent that clients would look up maybe both or what? I had added a slide on that, but only put it in the deck for the TLS working group. All right, I'll ask um, you then. The, you do that. 
But I think I think one thing on the structure of this, a part of why um, part of why there is the alias form is to get is to be able to to either see name or use the alias form for whoever is kind of operating example.com to be able to have the option of delegating and pointing this over to whoever is operating the service so that the whoever is operating those servers um, could be returning this record and the ESNI keys themselves so that in collaboration they could be could be doing that quick that quick rolling without having to do without having to go and um, find some way of getting the ESNI keys back into the back into sure. the the first part of the domain. Yeah, but, but generally, I mean, if, if if browsers did implement it, I mean, I guess you could handle it. But having the ESNI public key in in many different formats and different places in the DNS seems like a downside. But I don't know what to do about that. Ben Schwartz. So, uh, okay, on, on the ESNI question, uh, my view is that, that we should pick one, and I, I would like to pick this one and not do the other one. So that hopefully that answers that question. Uh, on the online signing thing, uh, Eric just answered this, but in case it wasn't clear, um, if you roll the ESNI keys once an hour, you have to sign them once an hour in this, in this format. There's no, there's no need for repeated signing. Uh, and on the topic of being generic, could you go back to the um, two slides, I guess? Uh, maybe only one slide? This one. So you can see on the lower example that there's something there, underscore 8443 underscore HTTPS. So uh, as defined, this, um, this draft does admit uh, essentially arbitrary new protocols to be defined to use this. And the, the data type that's in the service field domain value is essentially a uh, completely unstructured dict of keys and values uh, in a registry controlled by IANA. And the existing definition of the alt service field value says that it is extensible to non-HTTPS protocols subject to IANA control, basically. So you can, if, you're, if you write a draft that defines what alt service means for for any other protocol, for SSH or FTP, uh, then this uh, this draft automatically covers you. The only thing is that you do then need to uh, need to do the name prefixing, uh, as in the second example here. So, in that sense, this isn't as HTTPS specific uh, as maybe the name implies, but certainly HTTPS is the clear focus of the draft. Mm -hmm. And I'm totally open to to kind of the bike shed of names that are less of a mouthful. Hi, uh, Eric Orth from Google, and I lead the Chrome DNS team. Everyone keeps asking what browsers and other clients are thinking about this, so I thought I'd come give my thinking at least. Um, so we're, we like the sound of this, and we are tracking it closely. The one important caveat is the current thinking is we would only be doing this query when we have Doe mostly because a lot of stuff in it, has been mentioned, is not very helpful unless it's in a secure context, as well as also it, we're a little bit worried about sending out a third query for each request when we don't have a good signal that the upstream request resolver is a nice modern one that won't crash if we start sending extra queries to it. So this does mean that, well, yeah, there's been talk about size that Maybe that's not as much of an issue if we are only doing this over Doe. It also means that if we need some of this information like the zone apex issue, when Chrome is not talking Doe, there is still room for other solutions for this like a name. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, well, I will talk. I will join the HTTPS, HTTP, this uh, work, working group session and discuss with the chairs how to Proceed Great. and uh, where we can adopt the, the document. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next is Stephen. Will you present? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next up is uh, Stephen Farrell. Hi. So uh, yeah, I think we presented this draft last time. Uh, 
we got some feedback. We implemented the feedback in the draft. We'd like more feedback. <coughs> kind of done, really, now. <laughs> That's basically it. Um, what do I point the clicker over there? Yeah. Uh, so this is the summary. It allows you to kind of express a relationship uh, between two two names. You can one of the pieces of feedback we got last time was that people thought, yeah, maybe that's interesting, but I'd like to be able to express a, or disavow a relationship, so kind of a negative one. Um, and so we added that in. As part of that, um, you're going to possibly have a long list of people that, that you don't want to be associated with. So we changed the thing to say you can either have a name or a URL. And if there's a URL, then there can be a list of names. Um, so those are the kind of two main changes. Uh, there's, there's the optional signature mechanism is still there. Um, these are the kind of use cases that I think we covered last time. So unless somebody wants to jump up, I won't say anything about that really. Um, and this is the changes, which I mostly said. Uh, we had originally, you know, in the first version of this, we had a DKIM-like syntax, which is kind of a little bit what was like the, the values for the previous presentation. Uh, this time, it's kind of binary. We scripted up the sample generation stuff. So it kind of looks like it could work if people wanted it to work. And basically, we're just still looking for more feedback. We're not asking for it to be adopted just yet. Uh, if we get more feedback, and if that's of the nature that maybe this is something that might get deployed, then we're happy to kind of you know, do, do the changes to the thing and bring it to the point where hopefully we could ask for adoption. And I think here would be the right place to ask for adoption, if, if anywhere. Um, previously, it's been on the debound list uh, because one of the apps ADs thought that was a good place to start discussion. We can move it to the DNS op list if you prefer it. I don't mind that. And that's all I had. Jeff. Hi, Jeff Hodges. Um, yeah, this has been a can we've been kicking down the road for a long time. Uh, it's on the debound list because we did have a working group a while back that was specifically working on this problem, um, but nobody had the time to keep pushing it forward. We just kept kicking the can. Uh, it does need to get solved. Um, Andrew Sullivan and I believe firmly that this really needs to be in the DNS, this sort of information. Um, this, this draft is pretty congruent with where we were coming from. There is a problem statement draft out there. Um, if you search for debound in uh, file names, you can find it. Um, there's also the start of policy authority draft, which this is pretty congruent with. Uh, the, the, this draft does not yet cover um, all the intricities at this point in time. Um, it kind of glosses over various things. Happy to provide feedback um, down the road on it. I think uh, this is good work. It really needs to find a home and it needs to get solved. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, just on your comment about intricacies, my hope, and I don't know if it's realistic or not, is, is to not get mired in all the intricacies in this draft and just do the mechanism bit, but. Well, that's what I meant, yeah. is, is there's some mechanism things that aren't mentioned yet um, in, in terms of uh, the default, at this point in time, the default is assumed um, of everything relying on the DNS for the most part, um, that policy applies to subdomains. And that's not explicitly mentioned. Correct. Yes. And you need, we, you need to be able to say at some node in the tree that no, I do not belong to the policy domain above me. Um, awesome. So yeah, yeah. Okay, fair and enough. and also, um, the current draft has uh, it's optional for one endpoint to or one node in the tree to say I belong to this other one. You can unilaterally say that we disagree. We really we really think that you need to say it both both nodes, whether or not they belong to each other. Sure, I've, I've heard that comment from a few people and disagreed with all of them. Um, and I'm happy to keep disagreeing. But if it ever got adopted as a working group thing, then we would right. work. And, and we need to work. Our perspective is we need to uh, we sure. need to do this, and we need to work through it and, and make it happen. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm closing the line after the rain. Um, Stefan Bartmeier. I, I really don't understand why 
we don't, if we want authenticity, why we don't simply use DNSSEC? Today, the draft creates a very complicated authentication mechanism, copy and paste from DNSSEC, which adds a lot of uh, camel hostile complexity. So why not just cutting everything out and saying, if you need to authenticate this relationship, use DNSSEC, which is a proper way to authenticate things. Sure, you could. Um... Personally, um, and again, if, if, if that's what a working group wanted to do, fine. Um, but I think there, I, I, I'm still willing to make the argument that there might be value in cases where one part of the relationship does have DNSSEC and the other does not. And that's what the signature mechanism does. Uh, it is a bit, a bit complicated, but it's also a, v a vast subset of DNSSEC. So DNSSEC is obviously more complicated than what's in here. But it adds to it, yeah, sure. It's a, not a small subset. It's almost all the complexity of the NSSEC. Uh, okay. How long is a camel? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer that last question. Uh, John Bradley, Ubico, uh, I'm going to largely agree with Jeff. We have WebAuthn token binding, a bunch of different projects I'm working on. We, If we keep inventing point solutions to address this these you know, the same issues are coming up over and over again eventually we're not going to you know things will start falling over because we won't be able to keep up with manually maintaining lists and patches and I mean, it's it is impacting webauthn at the w3c and other other things where i you know i'm getting emails as we speak about why can't we, why can't Pfizer in the U.S. relate their European domain? This is unreasonable as far as they're concerned. This is something we have to progr progress. Yeah, I'm not emotionally attached to this particular spec, but we need to move this ahead. This may be a reasonable way of doing it. I'd be willing to work on it to make sure that some of these, that we have a broad selection of use cases that are covered by whatever the final document is. Great, thanks. Um, in the past, I, I used to be uh, fairly against this. I'm, I'm now flipping to the other side. I'm, I'm, I'm more in favor of it, of, of, of doing this. Um, I, I do see some problems that, that are not solved, and I'm not sure if you can solve them. Um, for instance, the, the one I see very frequently now at my day job is um, people doing surveys internally and then using a Google form and a shortener. And, uh, and so then it's a relationship between me and all of Google, and then it sort of doesn't really help me if everybody points to these super generic uh, uh, solution farms uh, domains. Um, so I'm not sure what the solution for that is and if that can be thought of somehow in this too, um, to, to have a, a, a more specific URL, I guess, because like I wanna, I wanna maybe specif specify some forms with like a Google form URL instead of a, uh, just a domain name. Mm -hmm. So that's one part. Um, I also agree with the, um, if you uh, use DNSSEC as the trust model, um, has some advantages. One, um, all the people that keep confusing transport security with, uh, with uh, authenticity of data uh, get another slap on the wrist of doing it properly. And, uh, and the other part is um, if the power bind draft uh, moves forward, um, then uh, that is actually your signal of saying, I am independent of my parent. Um, okay. And so you would solve that problem there. Okay, cool. Hi, this is Murray, honorary co-chair. Um, I talked about this the last time when you brought it up and the DMARC working group is also doing, we're interested in something like this. And I, we currently solve the problem with the public suffix list for better or worse. Um, and we've now right, just working group last called a document that is sort of a patch to that model that attempts to bring in slightly more use cases that are covered by that, but not quite. And I, I'm worried that we're going to continue on this path of kind of like one more, one more, one more warts rather than a more general solution. So I'd love to collaborate with maybe can this do something that replaces that entire suite of use cases and and solves that problem for us once and for all. I mean, there's a lot of people with allergies to using the public suffrage list the way we're doing it and so on. So I'm, I'm excited about this. I wanna see it move ahead. And if you need a 
home for it that isn't here, we'll take it or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this is good stuff, and if, if it simplifies our lives, then we'll be happy to move towards it. We even said in the DMARC document, as soon as something better than the PSL comes out, jump to that. So if this is that, then we want it. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. Thanks. So do, um, I guess the only question for now is, do you want to move the discussion to the DNS up list, or do yes, you? please. Yeah, okay. I think that's good conclusion here. Um, and please send feedback to the mailing list. And I think the chairs will discuss with you after, after the summer, of course, the European holidays uh, in September about uh, call for adoption. I think from the room there's a lot of interest and people want to work on the document. But I also sure. want to discuss with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And as a side mark for the uh, power bind, it's correct, <laughs> the draft. Uh, from what I understand, there was some interest in the draft but not on the mailing list, not expressed on the mailing list. So if people have an interest in the draft, please also express their interest on the mailing list because it's now being discussed on the corridor, on the hallway. Please correct me, Paul, what? if not correct. So if people have interest in power by it, please express their interest, etc., on the mailing list. That's important for us. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have... Oh. oh, sorry, put it, sorry, I thought uh, yeah. you're such a familiar face, uh, Paul, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. I don't break my mic. Hi, uh, so I'm here to talk about the DNS resolver information draft. Uh, I just noticed that the link there is for one of the instantiations of the oh. data types, not the resolver information draft, so we'll fix it later. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the main thing is we are looking for working group adoption. And the reason this draft exists is that primarily the primary use cases uh, it's originated with was for Doe. But there was some feedback that this should be generalized so it could be used for other pieces of information. And uh, so that resolvers can publish more information about themselves. And the DO information will move to a separate draft. So this draft proposes using iJSON to represent the information. It's presented in an extensible form using name value pairs. And the client is can query for specific names or a well-defined name called inventory, which gives you a list of all available information on that resolver. Uh, so there are two endpoints specified for querying this, one over DNS, which uses the in ARPA IP address of the resolver itself. And the reason for doing that is it may allow for using DNSSEC for validating the answers. And the other one is using HTTPS. Originally, we considered using a special use domain name, but that was dropped in favor of the uh, in address ARPA DNS name. Uh, so here's the thing. This one, we are uh, mentioning that you can implement this over DNS or HTTPS. And uh, the client could also decide to query this information over DNS or over HTTPS, which leads to an interesting interoperability question, which is if the server and the client implement only one of them and they are not the same, then they can't figure the information out. So that's something we are looking for feedback here. Uh, okay, that's it. Uh, questions, feedback. Ben Schwartz. So uh, I, I think I support adoption. I would like to solve this use case. I appreciate the, the work here. I have some personal uh, differences of uh, artistic differences with the, with the engineering choices here. Um, I, I really liked the special use domain name uh, formulation that you originally had much better than the, than the reverse IP address formulation because I think a, a very large fraction of users are behind DNS forwarders with the result that the, the true recursive resolver in play uh, has an IP address that is not known to the client. 
So for example, if ISPs wanted to use this service to, um, to uh, offer improved transports to their customers, I think uh, for residential ISPs, that would largely not work because most customer equipment, uh, most, most stub resolvers are behind a uh, DNS forwarder in their, um, in their Wi-Fi router. Now, if the Wi-Fi router actually just passes the true IP, it forwards the IP address of the, of the ISP resolver, then it, it will work. But I'd like to cover that use case. Um, I also think that the dot well-known um, solution is is not necessary. I think it might simplify things if we just pick the DNS solution. Thank you. Yeah, it's very brief. So you can kind of reply to that, Paul Artis. Um, we just in trans had a, a discussion about BCP 190 and using well-known, and we got pretty much shot down as in you cannot get an exception to that. So not using dot well known will be a hard problem. You will first have to convince the art area to uh, that BCP 190 needs updating. Right? So I think if the working group adopts this, we're going to have all of these questions. We don't need to do them now. And and yes, we need to if we go with dot well known, we're going to have to like get pre approvals and stuff. So yeah. So one, one gentle request, if you like, you can express uh, if it would be working group or. It will be adopted for the, by the group or not? Do no. you support it or not? Just uh, to get some sense from the room and from the comments. I don't like. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I, I keep the um, strategic remarks for later when we will have content to put here. But first, from a technical point of view, getting information about the network you connect to seems to me very close from what are doing the captive portal working group and also the entire provisional provisioning domains thing that is done, I believe, in the internet area. So is it, isn't it simply a, a very special case of provisioning domains? And should, should we instead rely on the provisioning domains uh, draft, which is, I think, near to completion? So to answer that, um, one of the initial use cases could be done in DHC, as, as you were saying, although there's when that was asked earlier in the Doe working group, there was very little interest in that. People said, no, we don't care. But in addition, this allows you to get other information about a resolver. It's not just for getting, finding out about dough. So a resolver might want to tell you other things about itself, such as, I prefer that you connect to me, to me over um, TCP, things like that. So that is really, a you know, this can be used by resolvers saying to stub resolver, uh, recursive resolvers saying to stub resolvers, Please do this with me. I am able to do this. So it really isn't a provisioning thing as much. Because remember, not all not all resolvers are provisioned through DHCP. People choose other ones in other ways. Still, it seems to me very sim a very similar problem. So maybe maybe it would be a good idea to add in the draft why provisioning domains is not a solution. Okay, that sounds good. And I hadn't even thought of looking at Capport. I will. I'm closing the line after Ben. Jim Reed, I just think this is an interesting piece of work. Attempts to solve a real problem, and I think the working group should adopt it as a document. Uh, Wes Herdiker, ISI. Um, so I, shortly before the IETF, I, I was actually going to write something very similar. So I guess I support this in concept. Um, I was going to do it in a completely different way. So the, the way I was going to do it was actually to create a single name that would give you a list of other records you could go look up, such like we already have some that are resolver-based, like you know what DNS key do you support and things like that. Um, the Actually, so one note on that that Puneet skipped yeah. over is new name value pair. If, if this goes through with the current setup, new name value pairs can be defined just by expert review and specification required, meaning just an internet draft. So it's very lightweight for adding in some of those. Yes, with the caveat that I was about to get to. So thank okay. you. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, architecturally, we're doing strange things with the text encoding values in DNS. We now have uh, records that are encoding in a number of different encoding, you know, mechanisms like SPF. You know, has semicolon separated kind of stuff. Um, this is now doing IJSON, and, and every time we f we fracture that. You know, we are limiting or or the number of things that can read it, or mandating that you know everything that needs to be able to read everything uh, go off and, and in, 
include the appropriate parser. And I, I don't know positively that we want to do that. Um, with respect to, it would be easy to add stuff. You're also building on gigantic record sizes and things like that, which is why I was sort of, you know, thinking about an index-based approach, you know, and doing it instead. Um, so, you know, again, I think I support the concept in general. Um, I'm not sure I support the implementation. I think that the DNS Up Working Group ought to solve this problem case, um, and we should get to what's the right mechanism. Um, so, so I, I support not necessarily the draft, but I support the the moving forward of it. And we're totally open to, like, for example, if people don't like iJSON and they want to go back to, you know, like you were saying, semicolons in between stuff, sure, that's fine. That's, well, and, and JSON makes fine. perfect sense for the HTTPS pool because you already know that, that that mechanism probably has it. But as you say, this would add another parser for some people. Maybe that's too much. Maybe we don't want to do it that way. We can do it in some other format. That's fine. On the top, uh, Ben Schwartz, on the topic of provisioning, uh, Provisioning makes sense when you're speaking about local information about the network. Um, I view this personally as non-local, at least my use cases, as I mentioned before, are essentially non-local. And in fact, architecturally, what I would really like, although I don't know if it's possible, uh, is a DNS trace route that tells me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, can we cut the might line before you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so as, as we consider adoption, I think we should also think about um, what design space is open, and what are what are we actually considering? Yep. And and this might add into that trace route a uh, thing if certain resolvers want to say that and want to say where they're doing upstream. No limitation on that, regardless of the format that we come up with. So great. So you folks will figure out about working group adoption calls. Yes. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, indeed. So I think concluding. There's interest, but there's, I think we need some additional discussion on the mailing sure. list, and then uh, maybe on the mailing list, or maybe with the next uh, uh, ITF meeting. Okay. We go for the, okay, go for it. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks. So, next speaker up is Giovanna. Right, uh, there we go. Yes. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. So today we're, I'm here presenting this draft of version four. Um, well, it's strange. I, I did something wrong. Let's give it another try. Here. All right. Yeah. It's not here. This did it. Yeah. It's all right. So just this is just a draft history. It was first presented at the 104 in Prague. <laughs> Um, just documented video the slides here. And today, the version four, we incorporated a lot of changes uh, based on the feedback we had on 04. Um, all those changes are open as issues, we're open as issues on GitHub. We want to cover that. And today, we'll, I'll be covering uh, most, uh, the most important ones only. And before I even dive here uh, to start to cover them, I would like to thank you again, everybody on 104, for the feedback. I think it was a little defensive. That's probably my, the way I'm used to academic conferences. But when I went home and watched the video, I was like, these guys are right. So thanks for the feedback. It was really nice. Um, so changes for 104. Um, uh, we had a discussion on the title of the word recommendation. That's very strong for the ATF. So we replace every instance of recommendations to considerations. Lehman pointed that point on. Um, he was concerned that we could reduce the setup's heterogeneity because if everyone would follow that recommendation. And then also were considerations that were used in many of other, several other DNS RFCs. And a note to self here, it's like an ETF recommendation is different from a paper recommendation. In a paper recommendation, it's more or less like an IETF consideration. Um, other issue, draft talks mostly about NECAS, but not exclusively. I think Joe Abley pointed that uh, except for the CTL considerations, our other ones are related to NECAS, and he is right. Um, but the thing is, like, this is a text we put there. Our fix is basically pretty much saying, yeah, that could be the case, can we work for other um, pr uh, applications, but uh, we have only done for DNS uh, academic study, so we cannot actually claim that it would work for the others, but could well, might as well work. Um, TTL consideration controversy, like Peter Koch, he pointed uh, how complex the issue was before uh, DNS up like 15 years ago. People tried to figure that out. It was a very complex problem. Um, 
And he also said like TATL is mostly for zone maintainers, not ops, but there, you know, there's some operators that are also zone maintainers, TLDs typically. Uh, and there's child and parent TTL uh, t as well. So it's an important issue. And to fix that, we actually rewrote the entire section. And we, because we had a new study covering specifically uh, these considerations of TTL, we, we just, I presented last Sunday here on IAPG and has just been accepted on the next uh, forthcoming IMC conference. Um, this is um, you here in this URL, you have actually the submitted version. Uh, a revised version will follow up after that. So pretty much we wrote the whole thing and now we kind of, uh, we don't we don't say like, hey, you should use a TTL of one day or of one hour. We just like measure, we carry, carry a lot of scenarios and situations and you show uh, what are the consequences and the implications of the choices. Uh, because before people wouldn't, you know, people would just copy and paste details and leave it running that way. But now we can actually make an informed choice on how to choose that. And regards performance, with regards caching, we've got a bunch of stuff. So I recommend you to have a look at that. Um, paper selection, issue 15, um, paper selection could be more diverse. Uh, we had three different uh, papers on the, to the references of this draft, which were not co-authored by us. Um, we also had this piece of text here to just say, hey, this document actually covers, uh, is based on uh, research papers and we recommend folks to read the related work section of those papers because they, they have a specific, they address that specifically. So that's what we have done. Um, I think George Markelson, he pointed out like Atlas, it's typically uh, biased towards Europe for one of our considerations uh, that was like a C3. And He's right, but um, I did include, and we have included that on version 03 of the draft, that actually the um, consideration about any cast in this paper, the folks, the authors, what they did, did not do it on the only analysis for the, all the ripe Atlas probes altogether. They actually break that down into countries and regions. So the consequences of that is, uh, uh, it's this text that we put there. It's a, in, um, given that, well, Atlas has a little bit more bias towards Europe, but the analysis per country per region does not change the conclusion that location of any cast instances dominates latency. And just to remind us, it's also peer review. And I think that's the most important issues we have changed. There's many more, um, but they're on GitHub and I just covered the basic ones here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Questions from the room? Comments? Uh, I have one or two questions. So, um, did, so Peter Koch and Joe Emily did get feedback from what I remember also from in the room. In yeah. the last person. Did they read the new version? Um, I, I'm not, I cannot say that. I, I'm okay. not sure positive about that. I'm not sure. I, I would be quite interested in their solution. So. There are two things. There was the, 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 the wording of the document that has to be adopted. Diemann also pointed out mm. that, um, and that has been solved. The other thing is, of course, to the working group, um, there's an, it's interesting to see that research uh, can be, well, finds its way to operational practices or uh, recommendations, etc., etc., considerations. Um, there's a group of people here in the working group they think it's very interesting and very good to have these documents in the working group. And, uh, but that's more the previous discussion about the wording. So uh, for the draft future, it's also, of course, up to the group what they think is a useful document. Because, yeah. um, and please, please speak up here in the room or on the mailing list. Also, operators. You also discussed things with any cast operators previously, I think. Yeah. We, so some of those considerations have yeah. been deployed by by us, like done an hour by uh, be wrote by others as well. We have to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. And their feedback was positive. Yeah. 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 All right. So in the room, how many folks have read? I, I had the impression a bunch of people have read this document. Oh, oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> just as a as a as a quick hum to get where we are as far as the future of this document, because there have been a couple of versions here. Um, if you think it makes sense for the working group to consider this as, a, as a, a working group draft, please hum now. If you oppose it as a working group draft, please hum now. 
Okay, so I, I guess the only thing we can say from that is, is um, we, we're asking room for more review and, and you to, to continue to take the feedback on. Sure thing. Thank, thank you very much. Oh. Uh, yeah, Matt Pound said. Um, I, have a, I have sort of a, a comment on the adoption question. Um, since this is a review, essentially a review of um, academic papers, I don't really see what the working group is going to do to improve it. it it's, it's an analysis of, of research that's out there. And, I, and so I don't really see what, what the contribution of the working group would be to improving it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really feels like an independent submission to me. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Next speaker. Put you by yourself. Good morning. I'm Kazunori Fujiwara from JPRS. I will talk about. Uh, Avoid fragmentation in DNS. Uh, Pass MT discovery is vulnerable. Details are presented in my presentation at Work 30 and this IEPG meeting. And DNS is said to be the biggest user of IP fragmentation because EDN0 and DNSSEC is widely deployed. Research papers described effective cache poisoning attacks using IP fragmentation and the MT discovery. Fragmentation considered poisonous 2013, IP fragmentation attack on DNS 2013, domain validation plus plus for MTM resident PKI 2018. As a result, we cannot draft fragmented UDP packets and pass MT discovery. Then we can avoid large UDP responses. EDS has, EDS0 has requested UDP payload size field. We can choose smaller value, smaller than pass MTU. And RC, 6891 section 6.2.1 says that note that pass MTU with or without fragmentation could be smaller than this. And truncation works well when responses exceed specified EDN cell size. Servers return trunked responses and client retry by TCP. And TCP is considered resilient against IP fragmentation attacks. RC7766 states that all general purpose DNS implementations must support both UDP and TCP. Then I would like to propose new recommendations. Full service servers should set EDNS0 requested UDP payload size to 1220, defined in DNSSEC RC4035 as minimum payload size. And authoritative servers and full service servers should set each and zero respond, responders maximum payload size to 1220, same value. And more, authoritative servers may send DNS responses with IP don't flag, IP version 6 don't flag options. And full service servers may drop fragmented UDP responses derived from DNS before IP reassembly. It is a countermeasure against DNS cache poisoning attacks using IP fragmentation. And last night, Paul Bixi advised me that, uh, that the constant 1220 is not good. Calculate from MT or link MT value. It is one idea. And uh, we need a special consideration in small MTU network. When DNS servers are located across the link with the MTU value less than 1280, choose EDNS0 requesters and responders maximum payload size fit to the smallest link MTU value. Otherwise, the response 
may be dropped. And the smallest MD value minus IP version 4, version 6 header size and UDP header size is possible it, uh, it in zero size. Or maybe another recommendation. DNS servers should be located at networks where MTU value to the major part, to the major part of the internet is larger than or equal to 1280. And deployment. The proposed method supports incremental deployment. When a full service server implements the proposal, the full, size, full service server becomes to avoid IP fragmentation in DNS. And when an authoritative server implements the proposal, the authoritative server becomes to avoid IP fragmentation in DNS. As a proposal case, DNSSEC or TC with shared key requires both requesters and responders support, not incremental. And uh, I, have, I have concern about dropping fragments not written in draft. Drop fragmental, drop fragmental responses and DNS responses with IP don't flag, version 6 don't flag options may cause DNS communication error timeout. And to recover the situation, full service user need to retry by TCP transport. It increases comp uh, complexity of full service resolvers, resolvers. And how do you consider, do you support this recommendation? Or do you like fragmentation? <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Comments, questions from the room. Hello, uh, Lars Lehmann from NetNode. Um, I think I, I, I uh, uh, you're writing what you say. Uh, the, the technical content in there is quite okay. So my comment is just uh, along the lines of, again, as with the last last uh, draft, the, how, to, how to put this to the end users and the people who deploy this. Uh, recommendations is a strong word. Considerations might be a better word. Uh, mm -hmm. Please, please have a look at, at how that is presented and, and I would like the working group to make a choice here how to present that. If it's adopted to, to the working group, be careful about how you present this to the people who read it. That's my only comment. But thank technically, you. yes, good, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Puneet from uh, Google Public DNS. So we are in favor of uh, fixing the fragment UDP fragmentation issue. So in principle, we support this. I think figuring out the MTU and some of the deployment considerations that can be figured out on the working group mailing list. Um, Eric Nagar Nakamai, have you been in coordination with the, the T, um, TSV working groups working on a PL PMTUD um, draft for datagrams? It's addressing, it's trying to address some similar things. It may make sense to collaborate with them to figure out, yeah, are there some ways to make this complementary? Because there may also be some ways to not have to set it, um, set the lo the low MTU in all in all cases, but only in certain cases. Thank you. Currently, no, but I need. Peter Spacek, Cizetnik. Uh, I'm on the pragmatic list side, so yeah, I do support the recommend. And as uh, software developers, we intend to drop the maximum to uh, EDNS buffer size. So effectively implementing what you are recommending. So yes, go ahead, please. Uh, Brian Dixon, GoDaddy, but previously I've done a little bit of follow-on research to the original fragmentation poison draft. Uh, it's much, much worse than that draft or that uh, doc uh, paper was. Um, if anybody's really interested, I can go into more detail at some later point. Um, I'm definitely in favor of that, definitely want to recommend that the developers of resolvers change the default on their EDNS buffer size to get it down to a reasonable level. Thanks. Mark Andrews, I see. Um, you mentioned TSIG. I've also got a draft which I've uh, submitted using a well-known TSIG key. 
um, which effectively allows the DNS level to detect any fragmentation reassembly. Uh, a successful, at the IP level, fragmentation reassembly attack and reject such a response. Um, looking at the Alexa top one million, uh, looks like three quarters of the servers there could deploy a well-known key today with just a configuration update. That's they all. That's about level of T. That's the level where they. That's the level of TSIG um, deployment in that um, set of servers. So I think there are ways around this without getting a rid of fragmentation. I realize people don't, people don't, sometimes don't feel like they need to solve the fragmentation problem. But you end up with other issues going to TCP too. Um, just want the working group to look at both yep. together. Please. Thank you, Mark. Uh, from the mic line, I do hear a support of the document. Um, I want also ask, want to ask the working group to look at the, the draft proposed by uh, written by Mark. And I think please give some reply, some comments, feedback on the mailing list, um, and we will discuss it with the chairs and with the author about the call for adoption later on the mailing list. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments? Yeah. Excellent. There we go. <coughs> Next presenter, presenter, John Woodward, on the bulk RR. Hi, I'm uh, <clears throat> morning. Uh, John Woodworth here to talk about uh, the bulk RR again. Uh, we've made a few changes. I've gotten a lot of good feedback uh, from the last uh, the last time I presented. <clears throat> so, those of you who are not familiar with it, it is basically a compact or condensed representation. Um, that can expand similar to a dollar generate at a meta level. Um, and it can also be transferred between primaries and secondaries in a condensed form. So a single record could expand uh, into millions of records. <clears throat> uh, it offers standardizations around um, some of the implementations that are already being done. S certain vendors have similar um, features and technology. Uh, this would just offer a standard way to exchange those records between the multiple vendors. Um, and I've also, in the field, I've seen um, record or zone files that have expanded um, well above 50, uh, even above 150 megabytes, which um, don't really transfer well if they do. Um, there's a lot of timeouts, a lot of errors. Uh, sometimes they'll have to be manually transferred, et cetera, or broken into smaller zone files. Um, the new draft, what I've done is I've broken it into two drafts. We had an NPN, which helps with the um, some of the offline signing capabilities in a pattern-generated um, record way. Uh, we also have a a uh, couple IPv6 uh, examples with the new the new formatting. Um, yes, and I've broken up the NPN into a second draft. Thank you. Um, and we are still trying to get this uh, adopted by the working group. So, any questions, comments? Jeff Houston. How do you sign it? 
how do you sign it? Uh, you either would use the NPN, which would modify the um, the signature and the validation mechanism. There's a, another record, or you would do online signing. Other comments? Please go ahead, uh, Warren. <clears throat> so Warren, Mari, Google. I mean, I've got a bunch of V6 space. It sure would be nice to be able to provide reverse DNS for it. There is no other way I can see to do that, like realistically, so. Right, thank you. <laughs> uh, all over, yes, I read this draft, I like it. I don't like the name of the record type, bulk, I think it should be a rename or something like that. And the draft could also use some more examples of the input and the outputs to the expressions you have. They're a little bit convoluted, and some of us are afraid of regular expressions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm open. So. Uh, I think all the authors are open to renaming it uh, as well. And uh, online signing is not a problem, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we would like to see a little bit more discussion also on the mailing list before we proceed. Right. Um, but thank you for the presentation and the, the revisions and updates. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So, permitting time, we had a presentation by Wittold. So, and we have time. We do well all the time. So, thank you all. There we go. Okay, so this should, this should be a short one. Yeah. Hi, I'm Vitold from ISC. Uh, the idea is a DNS resource record for transferring covert information from primary to secondaries. And uh, don't ask me about the covert. We've had this discussion about how to name it. So the idea is to transfer something that should not be queried for uh, in band with the zone. Uh, the idea is for it to be generic so that we can expand it with another R types without changing the behavior of the server. And the examples include Node RR, which we have a draft for this. Uh, Evan uh, is here as an author. Uh, DHCP timeout uh, from Tim. Uh, for example, NSEC5 keys, when if NSEC5 is adopted, and even zone signing keys for inline signing on the secondary. Although that's that's just an example. So don't be scared because that's the most of the discussion on the list was about examples and that's just an example. It's a generic for anything. Uh, the big, I think, the biggest issue was uh, that was on the list and in other discussions was about encryption and the security of transfer, because we are putting something that should be hidden and then we. Uh, we don't encrypt it. We don't mandate encryption. So, for example, for NSEC 5, the encryption is not needed because if you have the zone, uh, then the NSEC 5 key is not needed for it. If, um, it's not necessary for you. It, it has no value. But for zone signing key, it's uh, required. So the question becomes, should we mandate a form of security or a specific form of security like uh, XFR over TLS, which will be discussed, I believe, tomorrow, on uh, on deprive uh, tomorrow or thursday i don't remember oh, yeah but on deprive, on deprive. deprive yeah, has deprive yeah. uh so that's those are the questions uh, for the draft and the details uh well we there is a range in our type numbers that's currently reserved we want to cut a piece of it for uh for this kind of uh, records the question also becomes, should there be a private range for this kind of records uh, cut from also from the reserved R types? Um, there is a mechanism that disallows transfer to secondaries if they don't understand the covert semantics. So if there is a second, secondary that does not understand covert records, it won't send the EDNS option stating that I understand covert records and it won't receive the transfer at all so that it won't serve it. Uh, also, the server must not serve 
covert records without an explicit ACL allowing it. Uh, that's, for example, for a note, because a note is a record that someone, an operator might want to ask for, uh, but it requires an ACL. Uh, the other thing that's in, not in current version of the draft, because I thought about it on Sunday, uh, is that we should not, we should, uh, for generic types, generic binary types, we should change the name uh, so that the zone would not load if it has covert records on a server that does not understand covert. And uh, there is a usage. Uh, we published those two drafts sim simultaneously. Uh, there is a note RR definition, which is basically a comment in zone that can be transferred with the zone. Because 1034 has a zone comments, but X XFR came a bit later and those comments are not transferred with the zone. And sometimes it might be useful for operators to, for example, mark that this IP was given to this person and it's, you know, it's just a comment, but it, it stays on on the secondary. So yeah, that's it, basically. And the comments feedback, so it's useful. <laughs> so we think it's... <laughs> Work on this. It smells like database and I ACLs on top of it, and I have a bad feeling that eventually someone will come and ask, hey, I want to have only this group of users allowed to query for this type, <laughs> and that group of users allowed to query that other type, and stuff like that, and then you will have to invent mechanism how to transfer the ACLs and so on and so on. So I think it's can of worms, and it don't belong to DNS. Please don't. Hi, Stephen Barrett. I, I, I guess I'd also wonder how to think through the cases. If you're transferring a ZSK over TLS that depends on PKI, that depends on DNS, things might go wrong there somewhere, right? Like I said, that's, that's just an example. And uh, now I, well, I didn't want to put examples in the draft I put, and now, you know, that's what's happening. <laughs> Jerry Manderson, from a principled point of view, just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of this is orchestration mechanisms and orchestration information. I wouldn't want to see that in DNS. Warren Kamari, Google, but no hats. So the special range thing and taking like a bunch and setting them aside, that feels kind of icky to me. Uh, like I'm not speaking about the rest of it, just the, you know, going to take a check. Well, the, the idea was, you know, if you want to put, so, if you want yeah. to have something that's covert, then with each draft, you would have to specify that this should not be queried for. So the idea is to have a range in which you can put specific resource records like Node, like DHCP timeout, like anything else that, you know, servers with un would understand that they should not allow queries for. To me, it seems like you could have a type for covert and then stuff under that. But that that's subtyping. Yeah. And that's not allowed. <laughs> Evan Hunt, um, a few people have made the comment that this sort of thing doesn't belong in the DNS. Uh, and I just wanted to say that this sort of thing already is in the DNS quite often. Uh, it's just not in the DNS in a way that is resistant to open uh, normal queries from just everybody. Uh, and I, I have heard a number of people who are operators request uh, a way of putting something in the DNS that will automatically be replicated to secondaries that isn't easily queryable. And there is already data that is used in DNS that is not easily queryable. You can't look up an NSEC3 record. You receive it if you look up something that, that doesn't exist, but you can't specifically query for it. Uh, policy zones are often, uh, often have queries disallowed. That's just metadata for the operation of the server, but it can still be transferred over a channel from a primary to a secondary. What this is is a mechanism of having in-band data in the DNS that resists ordinary queries. And I think it could be useful in a number of use cases. And uh, some of those use cases have already been done in a less convenient and less secure way. I think that Evan has a point. Basically, this is inventing trans zone transfer protocol, which is intentionally incompatible with the old one, using the EDNS option to prevent the 
old slaves from getting the data, right? So I think it's opportunity to invent much better tents for protocol, <laughs> which allows like more flexibility and don't necessarily stuffs all the non-DNS data in its own file, right? I mean, this is the perfect opportunity to do the right thing and do new zone transfer protocol because the old one is quite horrible. So. <laughs> Uh, Wes Hardiker, ISI. Um, we have traditionally, so two two points, I guess. Uh, one, DNS is not designed to be a uh, a entity to entity type mechanism. So we have transferabilities and things like that, but we expect caching. We expect things to be transferred beyond that. Uh, we have signatures that exist over portions of it. We have a, a draft that you know, it's signing the whole thing. So you end up in these cases where if you have partial zones uh, where some entities have part of the zone and some entities have all of the zone, uh, you'll end up with... No, in this case, uh, all entities that have the zone have the zone. As if, if the covert records are not allowed to be transferred, then that's not going to be the case. Then they won't have the zone. <laughs> So right, they won't have the whole zone, which means they can't validate records that have. Uh, no, they 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 won't have the zone. If if there is a covert record, a zone cannot be transferred to a secondary that does not support covert. Right. So period. You're, you're prohibiting transfers yes. entirely. Okay. So second point is that in a security context, we almost always insist on uh, private information to be transferred out of band, not in the original protocol. So. It's unclear to me what the why it is needed to be in band in DNS protocol as opposed to a supplemental a bit of information like how we currently transfer security related information. Okay. Jim Reed, I'm sorry to say I think this is a very bad idea. Um, well, first of all, it smells a little of security by obscurity and then create some kind of special secret sauce where some special resource record types have got a special significant meaning and that will then determine the behavior of the server and how it then responds to queries. I think that's a very bad idea in the start of a very, very slippery slope. If we're going to set aside our types and say these are a special significance and they're going to be queried by certain clients or certain uh, servers under certain circumstances, I think that's a very, very bad thing to do. I think it will create very many difficult operability and um, operational problems if the stuff escapes into the wild. Now, yes, there might be a need for some kind of these kind of what I would class, not so much as covert information, but as out of band information. Maybe I, that might be a better description of it here. But if that information is sensitive, don't put it in the DNS. The DNS is public. <laughs> Lastly, man, let know, um, Wes beat me to it. I agree that I, I think this this type of information doesn't belong in the zone. I, I I can see a need to transfer such information between two two servers, but I think to do it in zone is probably not the best approach. I'm listening to the comments here. I, I think that having some kind of parallel transferring structure, maybe in, invent a new transfer type uh, instead of a normal zone transfer or incremental zone transfer. You, you know, that, that transfers parallel information, or we already had the, the NS control protocol, which is another method of, of, of transferring data. But I, I, I don't feel really, it doesn't feel right to have it inside the zone. Uh, Brian Haberman, re, uh, relaying a question from Jabber. Um, could this be done with catalog zones instead? Well, catalog zones convey information about a zone as a whole. And in this case, we can, for example, for note record, we can have a record in the zone, because well, we can have a record in the zone. So for example, uh, mac10.isc.org and the note stating that mac10isc.org uh, is Evans' computer, uh, which uh, catalog zones are a concept, well, it's, it would be possible to, for example, transfer zone signing keys with catalog zones because those are uh, those are values that are attached to a zone. But in this case, we want to have something that's uh, 
in the same hierarchy as the zone. So if we can have a record in the zone and a note for this zone uh, and a note for this specific record. So yeah, in this case, for example, for note RR or DHCP timeout RR, uh, it's not possible to do it with catalog zones. Paul Hoffman, um, just since I'm busily typing the minutes, I think that Peter said something that many people agreed with afterwards but didn't say they agreed with, which is this is an opportunity to create a new zone transfer program. If people don't like doing it this way, which it seemed like a bunch of people didn't, but they agree that there is a use case and might even have extra use cases, which it seemed like a bunch of people did, um, a different zone transfer program, it could be parallel that only does not zone. We don't, we aren't wedded to AXFR and IXFR forever if we can come up with a better way to do it. And I think I've seen better ways to do this written on whiteboards for the last 10 or 15 years. <laughs> so maybe this is the opportunity to do that, at which point in that new transfer, it's not just zone transfer, it's zone information transfer or you know zone configuration transfer as well, could include this. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all your contributions and comments on the microphone. Um, any closing remarks? Well, the, please fill in the, the blue sheet. Um, thank you all. And see you back in Singapore. Thank you. And thanks for the, the note taker, Paul and the scribe, Brian. So please fill in the blue sheets. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. 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 I could be five minutes. Yeah. yeah.